without further ado and yep no questions we'll go ahead and get into the lecture all right so we last left off talking about experimental research um so experimental research is the only one that can have that causal relationship and you can do this causal relationship is because you can manipulate something. So if you change something and you find that something else changes, then you can say that that caused it um, for the most part, right? So there could be other factors um, that in a laboratory setting, an experimental setting, we try to isolate all those other factors. Now, here's the problem with isolating other factors. Um, what if there are things we don't account for? Now that's true. In scientific method, you can't account for all the factors unless you've done a lot of research on the subject, right? So there are random factors too. So even if you try to account for it, if you don't measure it, so there's always this um, theory of like, can you predict someone's behavior? Um, in general, people say yes. You know, these studies, these psychological studies, especially, can predict people's behaviors. Uh, but in general, can they predict it in somebody for a specific instance? Now that's harder. You can predict people's general behavior, trends, patterns, but a specific incident, um, you might not be all that well. So predictions are like on average, most people do this, right? So 95% of people on average are probably gonna stay home. And that's being optimistic. That's probably like 70% of people who probably stay home. Um, but you know, some people just go out for whatever random reason. So, you know, protests and things like that. So you can't predict everybody's behavior, but you know, it's not going to be surprising. You know, social scientists have predicted that people are going to go against um, the stay at home order. It's always going to be somebody who goes against an, an order for whatever reasons. So, um, and they can predict what kind of individuals do that. So there's trends that they can predict based on various factors. So again, all these factors um, can be problematic in research. So what research likes to do is random assignment. We do random sampling and random assignment. So random sampling um, is you select people randomly by sample. Um, so there has been the COVID-19 uh, antibody test. Uh, so they're randomly surveying people. Not, yeah, I guess surveying people basically, but they're randomly testing people that are just walking around. So by doing this, they have a random sample of the population. It's not completely random because these people are walking around, so they're outside for whatever reason. Um, they're somewhat random, right? Um, to be truly random, you would have to like dial up people um, or randomly drop by in people's houses and be like, hey, you're one of the persons selected to do the swab. That would be like complete random. Um, so there is some issues with that, but they're still finding a lot of this random testing. Uh, they're finding people who have antibodies to COVID-19. That means that they were infected uh, and got over that infection or they're not showing symptoms, different um, stages of that. But basically they're saying that people were infected and had no idea they were infected, but they were spreading um, the disease, the disease, illness, virus, virus is probably the most appropriate statement. So yeah, so that's random sampling, right? So random assignment is when you assign people to different conditions, right? So. The problem with assignment is sometimes you, the problem why you can't select, let people select which assignment they want to be in is due to self-selection. So if we were to randomly assign people to um, social distancing or self-quarantine measures, um, we have to randomly assign people, right? We can't just say, hey, who wants to stay at home? Um, and then s assign people who want to stay at home to stay at home and assign people who want to go out to going out. Um, then you have a certain type of individual, right? You have some individuals who are like, hey, you know what, I'll stay at home. Um, I don't go out much anyway. I like being at home anyway. So more like introverted individuals will self-select to staying at home. And an extroverted individuals will um, self-select to going out. And then you kind of get this, this um, almost diff adherence, right? So we're, we're considering social distancing measure, we're assessing stay at home measures, and we want to see how much people adhere to the rules, right? You're gonna find that if you split people this way, some group go, uh, some groups of individuals stay home, and some groups of individuals go out. You can get like a higher adherence rate, right? Because the ones who want to stay at home got the stay at home condition, and the one that wanted to go out got to go out. So they're going out like every day. Um, so that's why iron assignment is important because if we mix up the two groups, right, you get a better measure. If you have the whole population kind of stay at home, then you get that uh, a more accurate measure of how much do people adhere to the rules? Like how much do people stay at home? 
So some people are introverted and they're going to stay at home and some people who are extroverted are going to get mixed into the stay at home group and you're going to see like how often do they kind of break the rules of uh, staying at home. So random right assignments important. You get a good mix. So independent variables is what we are manipulating. So this is basically whatever we decide to change. And our dependent variable is what we measure. So these two can be interchanged in a lot of studies. So in one study, you're going to measure this thing. But in another study, you can manipulate it, right? So in one study, you're going to measure test scores, right? So that's a um, dependent variable. You got to manipulate um, the instructor. So you can say like, OK, if you have this instructor or that instructor, we can see how that affects your test score. So the IV would be like instructor, right? Uh, professor and DV is test score, right? But I can create, um, well, let's explain the rest of this. The experimental groups are the group that experienced the manipulation. Um, so groups that in this one, we don't really have a, uh, a control group because no one is the baseline for this group, right? So we're just having different professors. Um, so both groups would be experimental. Uh, we don't really have a baseline group uh, for this measure unless you created a control baseline like an, uh, I don't know, a online teaching by a robot or something, then instructor wouldn't matter, right? Now, if we were to do something else, if we were to um, manipulate score instead, so if I were to change this to score, and then I wanted to measure something else like your final score. So let's say um, if I wanted it to manipulate, manipulate uh, an exam score, and then I wanted to uh, see how that affected your final, I can do two manipulation. So I can create two experimental groups. So one group would be like I inflated their score, so I made it higher. Another group, I would deflate their score. So um, I would make their scores lower. So in one group, I add 10 points to their scores across the board. Um, in a second group of students, I take away 10 points across the board. Um, and then I can have a control group here. This group has no change in their score. So they get their real score, right? So that's my control. They actually get what score they got. And I want to see how that affects their final. So you can say maybe groups that had a higher score, and you can make multiple hypotheses here, right? So you can say in hypothesis, uh, initial score uh, affects final score, right? Um, more, with more specifically, you can say uh, higher initial scores leads to higher final scores, right? That is a prediction in a direction. So that's a more a, a hypothesis I can test, right? This is a uh, change by hypothesis. We won't get into it, but that's more vague. This one's more specific, right? So let's go ahead and do this experiment. Let's think about this, right? So if I were to do this experiment um, and manipulate student score, I have to compare it to the control group. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a new slide, kind of the cool thing of uh, doing this on the fly. I think my thing was too high again. So, so here's how we're going to do about it. So we have uh, group one, like high score group, right? Uh, we have low score group, and we have a no change group. Right, so that's our control group. We want to see what happens. So we're going to guess at the results. Um, I'll also, you guys have an essay prompt on like the scientific method, so you could do something like this. So what happens if my high score group, my HS group, um, their scores actually, well, let's do it in a different way. If their score went high, right? If high score groups had a higher final score, higher final score, then my hypothesis is supported. Right, because that's what I, I asked. I said, um, I said higher initial score is going to be higher final grade. So that's my hypothesis, right? Boom. Now, some other things can happen. So what if this doesn't happen? Instead, what happens is high score uh, leads to actually lower final score. Then my hypothesis is not supported. Not supported. Something else happened. I didn't predict this. What happened? Um, but make, make sure I do random sampling. So just to make things straight, we have to random sample. So I have to um, random sample, and I have to randomly assign, right? 
So what that means is I randomly select students and then I randomly pick different students to add 10 scores, um, add 10 to that score and I pick different students to not change their score and I pick different students to uh, get 10 taken away from their score. And then across on average, um, I want to see how these students are doing. So if I find that students who had 10 points added to the score got a higher um, final score, I can say, well, it, it works, right? So if you gave them higher score, they may, I don't know, different reasons. So we got to, in science, we will have to explain how did you find this result? Um, maybe it's because they were more motivated or confident, right? Or yeah, you know, they got a really high score. So like, yeah, I could do it on my final same thing, right? Um, what happens if they have a lower score? How do I explain this result? Well, maybe it's, let me see if I have anybody. Okay, I have two people in chat. That's kind of cool. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So, explain result for a lower score. What happened? Well, maybe because they were overconfident, right? If you had a really good score in the first test, you're like, oh, I didn't really need to study. Uh, I, I still got a high score, so maybe they studied less, and that's why they bombed their final. So, I can explain those two results, right? So, uh, and other reasons too. There's a lot of explanations. A scientist usually has. Uh, explanations for why they have a result or why they didn't find a result. So that's one part of this experiment, the high score, right? But what about these two other parts, the low score and no change? And how do I know it's a higher high final score or a lower final score? I wouldn't know if I didn't have a control group. That's the thing. Uh, the control group helps with this. How do I know it's actually higher or lower than what I expect, right? Can I compare um, if they got like an 80 on their um, let's say 90 on their first score, first exam, exam one, and then they got a um, 100 on their final. Is that a higher final score? I, I don't know, right? Because I don't know, because what if they were going to score higher on their final anyways? Because that's just how the final was. Now, if they also had a 90, right, on E1, and then they had a 80 on the final. Again, I, I don't know if they would have scored an 80 or a 100 uh, because the final is not the same as the first exam, right? It's a different exam. I could keep it the same exam and see um, if there was improvement. It's possible, right? Um, but in any case, what I'm getting at is the control group. So the control group experiences no manipulation, so no change in score. So whatever score on average, on average, the control group, that is what I expect students to get. So if students are getting on average 80 on their E1, and then they are getting, I don't know, let's see, 90 on their final, right? Then I know that the first group actually scored higher because they scored higher than the average. They got 100. And I know that they scored lower if they scored below this control group. So it's in comparison to the control group. Are they actually doing better? are worse than the control group. So that's why you need a control group because you can't just figure it out, right? And we'll give you guys more examples of why control groups are essential. Um, now I had another group we haven't talked about, the low score group. Why did I include a low score group? That's a second manipulation I'm doing, right? So I wanna know, the low score group, what happens to their score? Do they get um, a higher final score or a lower final score and what would that mean if they get those results right so i won't go through the numbers but the idea is uh, if the lower group has a higher final score what does that mean well i have to compare it to my whole study right so if the whole study everybody gets a higher final score right so if the low score group and the higher score group uh both get a final so I have to compare it. So high score group also gets higher grade. What does that mean? Um, it, then it's it's kind of weird, right? So why did the control group get no min, no change and the average score didn't go up? But for some reason, when I messed around with students' score, it went up for both reasons, either lower or higher. Um, maybe there's two effects, so we can explain that, right? I can say I can try to explain and say, well, maybe extremes benefit students. What, what I mean by that is if students have a really high score, they feel good, they feel confident, uh, 
uh, they do well in the final. But also when students have a lower score than they expect, mainly they feel motivated, right? So then they become uh, the low score group motivates themselves. Man, I bombed that exam. I really need to do better on the final. So I'm going to study a lot more. So both groups scores go up. When I don't change their score, they get what they expect. And then, eh, you know what I did? It worked. Uh, I got the grade that I'm expecting to get. Um, I'm just going to do the same for the final. And so you get this no change. There's no improvement on their final score in one way or the other. So that's kind of how um, studies need multiple different factors to try to figure out what the explanation is. So we have ideas about how to explain these issues, but we need a you we need we, we need more changes, more experimental manipulations to really, really figure out what's going on, right? So we have to not just look at one part of the experiment, and we have to look at the experiment as a whole, right? So again, if this one. Um, if there was a difference, so let's say high, high score group actually did higher, low score group actually did lower, um, then you can see how like maybe the explanation is that um, motivation matters, right? So groups who, who scored lower, got lower scores, became demotivated, and students who had a higher score um, became more motivated, and so that resulted in this thing where students who had low scores didn't do well in their final, and students who had a boosted score um, did even better on their final. So, yeah, but you need the control group to figure out if they actually did better than on average, right? Now, here's the final um, final possible condition, right? What if across the board, everybody did well in their final? The low score group, the high score group, and the control group all got higher final scores. What would, how would I explain that? Um, well, again, you, you don't really know what's higher or not. Then it's really not higher final scores at all, right? So it's just students did better, right? From exam one to the final. Maybe they, the expectation is that you learned, right? So it's, it's expected that you do better on um, your class. Maybe it was like you, you got used to the exam. So the first time you took the exam, you're not used to the class. You're not, you're not, you don't know what to expect on the exam. So your first score is lower. Um, then you figure out this is what the teacher wants, what I should study for. And so when you take the final across the board, everyone does better. So there was no manipulation. The scores didn't matter. It was something else. It was a factor that we didn't consider, which was just like experience with the classroom with that specific instructor. So yeah, um, with experiments, there could be all these different possible outcomes um, with the experiment. Again, you just have to go through like a lot of different experiments. So um, this is usually a lot more interactive when we do this in the class, um, kids and candy, right? So if I want to study if can, uh, candy makes kids hyperactive, I'm gonna borrow a classroom of children, right? I need all children. Um, the reason why uh, is for different reasons. We'll get into that. So what is my IV? What is my uh, independent variable? Right, my independent variable, the one I'm going to manipulate is what? Oh, it's candy, right? Because I'm changing candy. I'm going to decide if some kids get candy or not. Um, operational definition of what I mean by candy. Um, it depends on what I'm actually studying. I'm, I'm, if I'm actually studying like sugar candy or chocolate candy or fruit candy, um, that would be how I defined it. If I say just candy in general, what if another person wants to um, replicate my study and they use a different candy, but they get the same results? That's why operational definition is important. And what do I mean by candy? Do I mean like a bowl of candy, a bag of candy, a single candy? So it varies from, that's why we need to define what we mean uh, with our variables. Now my DV is what? What am I measuring? The behaviors, right? So my, it probably means like hyperactivity. So I'm studying what we mean by um, hyperactivity, right? So how would I measure that? Well, varies, right? Um, I can say it's fidgeting. I can say the kids talk more, the kids running around. Um, so behaviors that I'm gonna measure as what I mark as hyperactivity, right? And again, operational definition. Uh, what is my control group? My control group is the one that doesn't experience the manipulation, right? So what am I manipulating? It goes back to the IV. I'm manipulating candy. So some kids are going to get candy, 
the kids. Those kids are going to be my manipulated group, right? And some kids are going to be my control group. They don't get candy. So they, I could compare their behaviors, the ones who don't get can, candy, with the ones that do get candy, and we can see how, uh, if their behaviors are different or not. So I asked the control group, um, I'm sorry, I asked the children who wants to be in the candy group, what happens? Probably all the kids are raising their hand. I can't do that, right? Because this is what we call self-selection, right? As I mentioned um, with the COVID-19 example bit, people are going to self-select into groups that they want. Now, if you're trying to give out candy, most of the kids are going to self-select into the candy group. Um, and if you don't give everybody candy, you're going to have a problem, right? Some kids are going to be upset. Some kids are going to be crying. Some kids are going to be angry. That's going to mess with my DV because I'm going to measure the kid's behavior. And what I define as hyperactivity could be fidgeting, um, talking excessively, or running all over the place. Now, it could be the candy, right? And it could be because I didn't give them candy, they're hyper. So you see how if I'm measuring hyperactivity between my group, that's the control group who aren't supposed to be hyper and the candy group, but the control group is acting more hyper because they're mad that they didn't get candy, um, then my my difference disappears. So we can't do that. Um, so what I would have to do is random sample, right? But I can't random sample in the classroom because the kids know which who's in which group. So what you have to random sample is you control classrooms. So one classroom gets candy and one classroom doesn't. And then you can measure the behavior because the one that doesn't, they don't know that they didn't get candy. They just like, oh, someone's here to watch us um, behave, right? Um, experimental validity. External validity is do your experiment results apply or generalize to the real world? So if I were to do um, this experiment, does it only apply to this class um, or the school or the city or the state or the country or the world? Now you can see that most studies um, are done on college students. Most of the psychological studies you read about are done on college students because college students are generally free. Um, in a lot of universities, especially research universities, Psych 101 has a research um, volunteer requirement. So either you write a bunch of papers on articles, or you just go spend your time, 10 hours of your time, um, volunteering for research studies through the semester. Or some, some might be higher, but I think the usual is like 10. So that means you show up to a lab for like an hour or two or whatever, how long the study takes, and then you just take off 10 hours and... Um, that's part of the requirement for the class, the graded requirement. So uh, most of our studies are done on college students, but we tend to generalize the results on to everybody. So whatever the college student answer, we assume that's how everyone in general will answer or will behave. Um, so that is a problem, um, but it's not a big problem. Uh, most people are like, okay, that's that's kind of weird, but at the same time, College students turn grow up to be adults, right? And they're, I mean, they're generally adults, but they grow up out of college and so forth, and the behavior shouldn't change that much. So uh, it mostly has been valid. Um, and studies that assess that tend to find that it's valid too. Um, some studies do find that it's different though, like what a college student answers and what a person in their 30s or person that's outside of college or a person that's 40 answers may be slightly different and that caused to question the validity of some of these uh, research based on college students. Um, but we, we put it out, we put out there what our sample comes from. So in the participants of the most articles in their research methods, it talks about participants and it says, who is your participant? And that's where you define like, oh, these are students from a university or a, you know, private university or private school or community college, we define that. We don't say it exactly, but we just say like in general, where does this population come from? And usually it's from like a university. Uh, sometimes it is from a community sample and uh, they would they would define how they got those individuals. Um, like the COVID-19 uh, antibody test, they would say it's from a community. Participants were randomly selected at various stores uh, throughout the community in the parking lot. Participants were asked to complete, um, get free testing for COVID-19 uh, as part of this study, blah, blah, and so forth. That would be um, pretty more generalizable 
All right, internal validity is, are you actually measuring what you're intending to measure in your study? So sometimes we think we're measuring something and we're actually measuring something else. Um, for example, if I wanted to measure your intelligence and I wanted to measure it by how fast you could run down the hall and come back, right? Usually I do this in the classroom and I would say, is it um, valid to measure your intelligence by your the time it takes you to get back here? And most of people would say, no, that sounds really weird. Why would my athletic ability have to do with my IQ? Now, what if I made it more complicated? What if it was like a scavenger hunt or something like that? Um, or you had to, you know, here's a map of the school or, uh, and then you had to figure out your pathway to get to a certain location. And there were shortcuts if you knew about them and so forth and all that. Um, and then there were also obstacles and decisions and like questions and riddles and stuff involving this process. So it was like a, a, a quest, right? A journey to get to one side of the school. Um, and if they were more complicated, like you have to solve this math problem or there's science problem or blah, blah, blah on the way, then, and, and then come back here under a certain amount of time, is it now a valid IQ test? Well, IQ, as we mentioned, is problem solving and being able to adapt to new things, right? So if I made it more complicated than just running down the hall um, and made it more complicated where you can sabotage your classmates or take things if you got there first, uh, that would provide you an advantage. Um, all that is going to make it more of a real IQ test. So my in internal validity can increase if I make certain manipulations, right? Um, are English tests, math tests, your ACT, SAT scores um, valid as a measure of IQ? Um, in, most of us don't really like the idea of testing measuring your IQ, but that's kind of how it breaks down. Remember when we talked about intelligence testing and all that? Um, that's one way for them to measure um, your potential in a sense. So internally valid, they are, um, they are internally valid measurements of IQ. All right, experimental research biases. So these are things we're going to talk about that uh, can be problematic when we're doing research. Um, so the experimenter themselves can be biased. They have their own beliefs, right, and expectations. Um, so the experimenter can be biased. So if I was an experimenter and I said, you know, every time I uh, wake up and my knees hurt, then it's going to rain. So here's the thing, I have a bias, right? So every time I see that it's rain, I think back, did my did I wake up and my knee hurt? And I was like, oh yeah, my knee hurt today, and it rained today, and therefore every time my knee hurts, it rains. I'm biased, right? Because sometimes it doesn't rain, and I woke up and my knee hurt, but I didn't think about it, so I forgot about it. And what about those false um, times when I wake up, my knee hurts, and it doesn't rain? I don't remember it, but every time I wake up, and it rains and my knee hurts, then I say, oh yeah, I remember these two things occurring together. So experimental bias is there. And a lot of scientists um, come up with experiments and they want the experiments to be right. Um, so that leads them to maybe manipulate things, sometimes in ways that they know and sometimes in ways that they don't know um, that can cause the experiment to um, go a certain way. So let's talk about some of these things. So a double blind experiment is when the experimenter or the, or the person who's collecting data doesn't know uh, what experiment you're in. And this is useful because sometimes if you do know, um, you may manipulate it. So if you were studying something on happiness and you believe that people who ate candy were happier um, and you know you, you gave a candy to somebody and you're like, oh yeah, this person's going to be happy later because you know, maybe the candy's laced with marijuana or something. Um, so they're going to be in a good mood. And you know that already. You may act in a certain way towards them that elicits that good mood. So we can call this a demand characteristic. We are susceptible to being influenced and we want to be liked or right. I mean, um, if, the, if you act a certain way towards participants, they may return that in kind, meaning they will act in a way that's like it. So if you know experiment is I don't know, high on some drugs, um, you may be like, hey, tell them jokes or laugh at them or smile at them more, and that can cause them to be in a better mood and then that messes with your experiment. So um, you want to be double blind. So you, the thing is not knowing the experiment. So with the same idea, going back to kids and candy, right? So if you knew which classrooms got candy, you may be biased in recording this kid's activity as more hyper because you expect them to be more hyper because you gave them candy. So then you would be biased in showing that, you know, candy makes kids hyper. 
because you know the group that didn't get candy, they're going to be a lot more calm. Um, you're biased and you don't know, so you you know that they're not going to act hyper, so you're not going to record as many hyper behaviors, right? So to have a double-blind experiment, um, you would bring someone else in. You would bring like a research participant, a research assistant in. So someone else who doesn't know if the kids got candy or not. So one person comes and gives candy to the kid and collects like the consent form, which we'll talk about later. And then, and then someone else comes in and this person doesn't know if the kids got candy or not. Hopefully the kids don't talk about themselves getting candy. Uh, it does happen in some experiments where participants uh, drop the beans or whatever. Um, but yeah, so you, you bring someone else in and they're recording the behavior and they don't know if the kids got candy or not, then they won't be biased. They'll record every hyperactivity behavior. And kids also are the demand characteristic. We refer to kids being hyper because they think candy makes you hyper. So if you go and you tell them, hey, kids, I'm going to give you candy, and I have a hypothesis that candy makes you hyper, kids might act hyper even if they the candy doesn't make them hyper. That's a demand characteristic because they're behaving to what they think you want them to behave like. The expectation is there. The expectation that if I eat this candy, I'm going to be hyper is there. So maybe it's not the candy that makes them hyper, but it's that expectation, that demand characteristic from you that causes them to act in a way that you think they're going to act. So self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, single blind is the most common, meaning that most experiments, it, the, the experimenter knows what condition you're in. Um, and that's generally okay if they don't really have a hand in uh, measuring your behavior. So like, for example, I used to do research and I wouldn't know which condition the participants in because I have to set up the computers, um, but I don't interact with them. The computer interacts with them. So the computer doesn't give them any bias um, information, right? So it's just me. I know the condition, but it doesn't affect the experiment itself. All right, uh, research samples. We have uh, the population, fancy term. Uh, it means like all of the sample you're looking at. So if I want to study students, my population will be all students. And what I mean by all students, I mean all students across the world. That's a huge population. Um, so most of the times we can't study a whole population because there's just too much of that population. Uh, no money for all that, right? So what we do is we take a sample, a smaller set of that big population of students. So my sample could be students at OCC. Um, that could be very broad. I can look at schools. I, the, the sampling level um, can be very different, right? So I can say uh, students in first world countries. I can say students in English speaking countries. I can say students in the US. I can say students in um, the West or the East or North or South, different regions. I can say students in New York, right? Then I can say different, do I mean like all students? I can say, you know, students at SUNY, or I can say students at OCC. So as you see, each time I'm saying this, I'm narrowing down my sample, right? Students at OCC, I can even get more narrow, right? I can say with different majors, right? Social science students at OCC, psychology students at OCC, students in Professor Tran's class, right? So my sampling gets narrower and narrower. Each time I make it more narrow, I lose generalization. So that means I can generalize less and less, right? Each time I get more and more narrow. So how much do my results actually generalize to students in general at OCC? It becomes more narrow. Students at, at uh, Professor Tran's class is more narrow than students in psychology and more narrow than students in the social sciences. So less generalization each time. Uh, sampling issues, non-representation. Sometimes we, um, the more narrow we get, the less representative it is of the general population. And how do we select students for participation? Remember, we still have to use random sampling, right? If I just say, hey, um, I'm assessing how great I am at teaching, and I only want students who um, are favorable towards my teaching to participate. That is a biased participation, right? Um, asking for voluntary participation from students is already pretty biased because um, if I ask you to complete a survey, it's optional about my teaching and stuff. You only get like students who really like the class and students who really hate the class that would probably participate because they want to say bad things or students, just positive students saying good things because they're like, hey, you know what? Uh, it's voluntary. I'm, I'm going to go there and 
say how much I like this professor. So then my results were really biased that, you know, Professor Tran is like the most wonderful uh, professor in the world kind of thing. All right. Um, yep. Laboratory settings, uh, research settings, rather. You have laboratories. Um, laboratories aren't like cool science lab that you think of when you think of laboratories. Uh, a laboratory could be just like an office or a classroom or a room that's meant to collect data. Like laboratory settings at um, lots of universities just involve like a room uh, with a bunch of computers that we can collect data on students from. That's basically it. Usually in some basement, small rooms. Yeah, uh, it could be dark and scary. Or it could be completely online, right? Naturalistic observation is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, just watching people unintrusively, right? So watching them in real world settings, uh, watching people just in general. When you engage in people watching, that's a naturalistic observation. In general, you don't want them to know that you're watching them because what happens is a demand characteristic. When someone knows you're watching them, uh, then they act differently. You guys ever get that? Like when someone's, you're like eating, right? Enjoying your meal in the fishbowl. And then you notice someone's watching you and then you're all like concerned, like, why are you watching me eat? Then you're going to eat more carefully or you just stop eating, right? You're like not messy um, as much. Um, so that's a demanding characteristic. People act in a different way. So anybody that live streams or something like that, um, goes around IRL in real life and reports himself, they act in a way that they are thinking other people are, they are aware of how other people are watching them, right? So that's a demand characteristic. Uh, the DRM paradigm, we did that. That was the memory chapter. So, um, I took it out that remember the DRM paradigm. That was the one with like the word list, right? Ethical research, um, ethical research started after World War II. Uh, and it basically says that we can't just do whatever we want to people. Um, before it was like the wild, wild west, where it's like, hey, I'm doing an experiment and here's the money I'm going to give you for it. And if you want to participate, that's on you. And whatever happens, that's on you because you agreed to volunteer and you knew the risks of volunteering. Um, that doesn't fly anymore. So research is a lot more ethical now. Um, we have certain restrictions and requirements for people. Um, you can't just harm people for no reason. And we call that the ethical research, the IRB board, um, and human participants, and as well as animals have certain rights. And the World War II had a lot of things. And they we're always talking about like evil Nazi scientists. Um, that's a real thing. The Nazis conducted inhumane experiments on people, um, torture and all that stuff. It just for like, hey, cool, let's see what happens if we do this. And that is not uh, um, good. Um, but at the same time, Americans were also doing uh, experimental research, not as bad as the Nazis, but they were also doing uh, inhum well, unethical research uh, by our standards now. Um, just remember Baby Albert, when you could bang the, the loud noise behind Baby Albert and all that stuff. Um, you probably couldn't get that past now. That would be like unethical now. Um, but a lot of ethics back then were, um, in the name of science, were allowed um, for a lot of reasons. So one big study is the Tuskegee syphilis study. So what happened in this study was, uh, it was, I think, a medical study, and they were allowed to, um, they wanted to see the progression of the disease of syphilis. Pretty fair, right? So let's just uh, get a bunch of people who tested positive for syphilis, and we're going to study what happens to them um, as this, degree, this disease progresses, right? The problem with this study was that when they were studying it, they found a cure. Right. So why the study was running, um, someone else found a cure. Now, here's the problem. The, the syphilis study had these patients go to certain doctors that did not tell them that there was a cure. So they basically was like, hey, keep them because we want to see what happens to the disease. So we can't cure these people because we want to see what happens to the disease until they die kind of thing. Uh, and that became very unethical. Right. It's like, hey, I found a cure for AIDS, but I'm not going to give it to you because I want to see what happens to you as this AIDS kills you, yeah, that sounds horrible. Um, so, but people did it. People who <laughs> suffered from syphilis, had a cure, but they were not told the cure by these doctors that were paid by these uh, people who were conducting these studies. So that was very unethical. So now 
uh, we have that in as a rule that if you're studying something and a cure is found, you have to tell them that the cure exists and they could basically exit your study and take the cure, right? So that, that's a pretty much standard for a lot of experiments now that you can exit the experiment whenever you want. Although you guys remember um, the social uh, obedience or Milgram, Milgram's obedience study, even though people were told that, hey, you can quit this study at any time, you know, quit this experiment at any time you want, uh, a lot of individuals just um, feel I mean, compelled, right? You know, obedient to continue to study, even though they were feeling a lot of uh, stress and anxiety from having to continually shock the person. Um, so it's always funny because we, we teach scientific methods to students and we teach them about like being able to leave a study at any time and we teach them about um, basically the consent form, right? The consent form have these procedures in them that says, hey, you can leave the study at any time. You are not supposed to be penalized for it. So very little students actually um, try to cheat the system and go into a study and like do half of it and be like, oh, I'm done. I want to leave now. We can't actually stop them from leaving because you know, part of the consent form says they can leave whenever they want um, without penalty. So there's this that gray area of like, hey, can do you give the student full credit for the hour if they left 30 minutes in or if they left after signing the consent form kind of thing. So the school has this gray area where it says, you know, if the student is not doing it in good faith, then they don't get credit. So you can't just like sign the form, sit down, do five minutes and be like, you know what, I want to quit the study and get full and full hour credit. But we don't have that requirement here, um, so you guys don't have to do, uh, we don't even have studies that really run here, so yeah, research is not a big thing in community colleges. All right, ethical research uh, for animals, so we have a respect for animals, and this does not equal human rights, so that, what that sign means, does not equal animal rights. So um, yeah, there, there are a lot of research that, that kills animals, and that's normal, that's, that's ethical. Uh, in our standards, right? So when I was a master's student, we, we, I was visited, visiting different colleges. Um, there was one I visited. I wonder if it's here. I wonder if it was um, Binghamton. Uh, it might've been Binghamton, um, but they had a lab and one of the animal research lab there was um, what the, the research assistant had to do was watch these rodents. I don't know what kind of, what type of rodent they were. They were like this special uh, type of rodent, I forget which species. Um, but they had to watch the mate, right? So they had to put these two rodents together, watch the male, mate with the female, and then immediately grab the male and chop off its head. Like, grab the male, chop off its head while it's still alive. I was like, whoa. Um, but apparently they were approved for that. So that means it must have been really justified why this was the only method, no alternative method to studying whatever it was there. So they were studying. They were studying like some type of chemical reaction um, in the rodent's brain after mating a reproductive behavior. Right. I think you guys are picking up some background noises. All right. Um, so yeah, so as long as there's no alternatives, you have to prove that there's no alternatives. And in most cases, you're supposed to use anesthesia. So whatever, if you're going to do surgery on the, the animal, you're not supposed to just do open surgery on the animal. You're supposed to anesthetize them. Um, and most times, if you are going to kill them off, you're also supposed to anesthetize them before uh, killing them off. Um, so not like the slaughterhouses where you immediately just kill the animal. Um, it's, it's done with a lot of procedure and a care for humanity um, that minimizes the harm that these um, animals experience. So we're not just out there harming them. And that means in their living conditions too. So in general, their living conditions are kept very well, uh, maintained and cleaned for the purposes of not messing with the data we get on them. Uh, so you wanna keep their, their health and all their living conditions in optimal conditions so that it doesn't mess with the results that you're getting. So that requires a lot of training. So you can't just pick up anybody off the street and say, hey, I got some um, chipmunks. Do you want to play with them? Um, and as, you, as long as you change their food and clean their cage, um, you play with these chip chipmunks all you want. Um, that's not allowed. They actually have to be trained in animal research um, because if you handle the animal in a certain way, it can cause them to have uh, you know behavioral effects on whatever you're measuring or medical effects or biological effects. So we're actually not supposed to play with animals at all um, and keep them in very like perfect lab condition. So 
There is more issues with truth in reporting. So with animals, they can't speak up on their data. So there's more concern with like data falsification. Um, there's been cases of someone who has falsified data before um, with animals because again, you're you're put you're inputting this data down. You're writing it down. Um, and you want your results to be valid. Um, I think a big one was like somebody working with like um, a certain monkey um, and his monkey lab, and he got these results and no one could replicate it until um, they, he kept finding these results and he kept publishing them and no one could replicate what he was doing um, until one of his grad students, I think, blew the whistle and said, hey, this guy's faking the data. Uh, so that's what happened. So it does come out if no one can replicate your study. Um, that you might be lying about it. All right, um, last slide, we have uh, informed consent. So this is asking people to consent in the studies. Um, you might have seen this every, every time you have been asked to complete a survey. Um, usually it requires or participate in something that they, they give you a form that says, hey, this is what you're agreeing to participate in. Um, sometimes it's an oral consent. So you can ask, hey, I'm conducting uh, a study on blah, blah, blah do you want to participate or could you participate in the study and you say yes that's oral consent um sometimes we do that with kids uh but usually we try to get paper consent so we would read to the child like a child version of the consent form um, we would send a consent form home with their parents like an adult version of the consent form that says hey i allow my child to participate but children have rights too so even if the parents say hey um i let you collect data on my my kid um, you also have to ask the child themselves, are they willing to do it? So when I was doing research, um, we were having students do some uh, number research, number lines and stuff like that. Um, before we started the session, we had we asked them like, hey, here's what we're going to do today. Do you want to um, help me out with this project? And they say yes. And sometimes they write their name on their special form. Um, and I've had kids sometimes say no. like. During that day, we bring them out and then they decide, actually, I don't want to do this. And they say no. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll bring you back to class and I'll take a different student. Um, confidentiality, we have to keep most information confidential. So when you collect data, we usually don't take names. Um, we just collect the data because names can be, can violate confidentiality. Um, when we do surveys, we don't ask for names because, you know, if you have to put your name down, you feel less anonymous and you might not be truthful in reporting your data. Um, yeah, I, if you, I don't know if you guys remember having to complete a survey, um, health survey, um, in like middle or high school. I remember we had one, they asked us about our, like, our drugs and our sexual behavior and stuff like that, and it didn't ask us to put our names down. They just wanted to see how many students were doing drugs and um, having sex. So that was like this survey, and they were like, your parents are not going to know about this. I don't know if my parents even knew that they were going to assess us a survey or approve of it. I think there might have been some violation there because I remember uh, them just giving us this surveys um, to the class. So, yeah, usually it, 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 your parents know if your parents probably gave consent if you were like brought out for it, like specifically to get a survey completed. But your parents are not supposed to know your answer. That's the main thing. So confidential, they have to say, hey, whatever you answer in this, we're not going to go back and give your parents a survey. Now, debriefing is sometimes used for when we are deceived. So with the Milgram study, um, deception was used, right? So they didn't actually shock anybody to death. Um, so they had to be debriefed. So they had to be told like, hey, um, this was a fake experiment. There wasn't actually someone there. We recorded it. So you didn't really kill anyone. Um, imagine if they didn't have that requirement. So people from Milgram's study would have been like, man, did I kill someone today? Like walk out of the study, like I killed someone for like $20. You know, that person stopped responding. Um, and they had to be like worried about uh, something happening to them or, you know, hearing news that this person's dead. So of course you have to debrief and tell them the truth if you lie to them. Now coercion is when we provide too much for a study. Um, so if it's like a thousand dollars to do this experiment and it has a lot of risks and it could be dangerous, that could be coercive because some people really need a thousand dollars and um, they know the risk is there, but they do it anyways because the study is too coercive. It, there's nothing else they could do. Um, thinking about this in like uh, student terms, um, if a study was offering you like a hundred points extra credit or, you know, a, pretty much like an A if you do the study, that's considered coercive because you have no other options except to do the study because you're like, man, if I do study again, hey, I'm going to do the study. That's coercive. So 
um, when we are trying to pass the ROB, they asked us what our um, what we're rewarding students with, right? So it's it, in most cases it's like hours, participation hours. So if you did a study and you said I'm going to give them ten hours for one hour of work, uh, that's coercive and that would be unfair to everyone else, and your colleagues going to hate your guts. Um, so that's not approved at all. So it has to be valid to how much work they actually do. You can't be like they're going to do one hour and they're going to get like five hours of work. Uh, that would be coercive too. So it has to be fair, um, fair trade for their uh, effort. Protection from harm says you cannot just uh, do a survey and just hurt people. So if I was doing a, stu a survey that was coercive and it had harm in it, um, that wouldn't fly at all with the IRB. If you guys watched Ghostbusters, the first one, um, darn, Bill Murphy at the beginning, he had a study and he was like shocking the guy to see if he could be uh, read the, the card and stuff. Um, that is not protection from harm. He was just kind of shocking people for fun. That wouldn't be allowed. Um, similarly, you can't do shock experiments. You can't just do like mean experiments for no reason. Um, someone has to analyze why are you hurting the, these individuals. Um, you can't put, make experiments that are too long too. Like if I want a six hour or a 10 hour experiment, I have to really justify that. Um, and if that's going to be harmful to my participants or not. Um, and we do that through a risk benefit analysis. So a group of people decide if the risk is worth the benefit that you're getting. Um, so a lot of times they say self harm, um, harm to the participant in whatever way uh, is not worth it. Therefore, we're not going to let you do your study. Um, sometimes they allow it, right? So there's a Milgram study, for example, um, seems kind of really unethical because you're like putting people through a lot of stress about shocking someone um, to basically death. Um, but the risk and benefit, they can still argue like, hey, we should replicate Milgram study to see if there's been any change. Are people more aware? Are people more humanitarian now? Um, so the argument can be made that some studies can be replicated but not to like an extreme level. So they, they, they try to limit the exposure and stuff. All right, so that's it. Um, it took longer than I thought, um, but that's pretty much it for scientific method. Um, and it, it, it is a really hard topic because there's so many nuances with this um, and you, you kind of have the shallow understanding of it right now and it's probably going to deepen the more you're exposed to scientific method. So if you're still confused about scientific method, watch all those videos that I posted under the final exam practice and you know it's better to have someone else kind of explain it. Um, maybe that'll work. So that do do that and yeah just watch this beginning video as well. So make sure you watch that video as well as the one posted on um, the final exam study material to understand scientific method better. All right, so good luck on everything for the rest of the semester, your quizzes, discussions, uh, exam practice. Um, I'll continue sending that weekly uh, email that tells you what kind of grades you have. Um, so you can go off that. It's always going to say current. It's going to say like what date. So that can change as we... Um, get further into uh, the end of the semester so all right and then remember to email me if you want a report back about like exactly how well you're doing in the class or any confusion you have all right stay healthy i'll see you guys bye